It is 1880, or thereabouts. The center of Australia is only recently being entered by European explorers. A man on camelback sights a natural wonder, what will be called Ayers Rock. A contemporaneous traveler described it thus. Above the yellow sand and dull green mulga rose the rock, a huge dome-shaped monolith, brilliant Venetian red in color. It stands out in lonely grandeur against the clear sky. Drawn to the rock, our traveler finds a cave at its base. He enters. Tucked into a natural shelf are several plate-sized stones wrapped in strands of ochre-stained human hair. He strips this off, revealing on each stone surface engravings of complex designs. He loads all the stones into his camel saddlebag and leaves. Perhaps three days later, at an isolated Lutheran mission, he unburdens his beast, leaving with the missionaries these objects of mystery and concealment. Many decades later, another man is in that same desert conducting geophysical surveys. He leaves his work camp, traveling alone in a land cruiser toward the town of Alice Springs. He stops for refreshment at the Lutheran Mission, hoping, always looking, to acquire another cultural artifact. At the mission's sundry shop, he's offered his choice of several engraved stones, pilfered by an early camel-born explorer, he is told from Ayers Rock. He pays a few shillings for one, the best preserved for the lot, he writes in his diary. He, my father, will bring the object home to Dallas, where, counseled by the anthropologist David Dr. Friedel, he learns the name of the object, Chirunga, and of the stone's essential link to the aboriginal religion, the dream time. In the book, The Song Lines, author Bruce Chatwin puts it succinctly. A Chirunga stone is the aboriginal's holy of holies. My father was a man of conscience and was often heard to say, the stone should go home, a motive not fulfilled before he died. More decades pass. It was in the year 2000 that I found myself middle-aged, mid-career, and nothing much happening. Dad's Chirunga stone, which had been retired to a shelf, drew my attention, and my father's words returned to me. The stone should go home. Entirely unsure if home even existed any longer, I determined to return the stone as deeply as I could into Australia. Now, what is this Chirunga stone? Typically, they are flat, an oval rock cut into its surface will be patterns precisely arranged. In the center of mine was a large spiral, its bands winding inward round and round like a clock spring, terminating at a central node. And six sets of concentric circles were positioned at the stone's cardinal points. The markings were perfect in graphic simplicity and perfectly cryptic in whatever message was intended. This is how a senior anthropologist in Australia explained my charanga to me. Your stone tells the story of a dream time adventures of one mythological character. Its story begins inside the earth. That is its essential potency. She pointed to my stone and its central spiral. It emerges here up from, say, a water hole. In human or animal form, it's alive. It's in motion. He makes his camp. She points to an outer spiral. Then his pacing around his fire is marked by the second one. She points to a third and fourth circle. He's traveling about the countryside, shaping the land here and here, ending up at camp back here. She jabbed her finger into the center of the first spiral. The being goes back down whence he came. It resumes its, immater its immaterial form, but its Chirunga body is left topside for the people. It leaves itself to their care. During its absence from Aboriginal ownership, my father's object, along with others of its kind, had come to be known both as highly restricted sacred secret objects and the crown jewels of Australia. Chirunga stones, 
<coughs> pardon me, Chirunga stones dispossessed by trade or theft or forfeited to missionaries were lodged in important collections worldwide. I arrived in Australia, unbeknownst to me, while a major effort was underway to repatriate these objects and, where possible, to return them to traditional ownership. Those were the first decades after UNESCO, <coughs> I beg your pardon, <coughs> after UNESCO called for the return of cultural property. The headiest years of a global effort to recognize the rights of owners to their displaced materials. My project, therefore, drew interest and support, and from some, a good bit of justified skepticism. Richard Kimber, revered Australian historian and storyteller of Central Australia, sat with me at the back of an emptying auditorium in Alice Springs. For half an hour, he gave me his undivided attention. Dick relishes his days <clears throat> and nights spent out bush with the old Aboriginal men. He'd witnessed dozens of restricted ceremonies, been given audience with heaps of sacred material, and is universally respected for the confidences he keeps. He allowed me to show him my father's Chirunga stone and offered me his guarded view of its antiquity. Just my opinion, mind you, based on factors like its base material, patination from red ochre applications, its distinctive profile, and the probable age and stature of its manufacturer. He puzzled over its possible source from a dozen different angles. The social and geopolitical forces that funneled the flow of Chirunga, who my Chirunga's pilfering explorer might have been, the missionary suppression of heathen practices, and their trade in artifacts and the subtle pressure of assimilation on aboriginals to sell off their treasures. He described the distortion of sacred designs on Chirunga made for tourists and the advisability of matching my stone's designs with other collections of well-sourced objects. There was a time, he told me, when travelers to the center picked up Chirunga stones with no idea what they were doing then lighten their loads by dropping off their curious out in the desert somewhere. Once recovered, one could only say, what on earth have we got here? The enormous pity, he told me, is that you will have none of the old men left alive out there to talk to. This book, Sacred Errand, is the account of my effort to locate the rightful traditional owner of my father's Chirunga. It is the narrative of the stone's return, but if the story has any importance, it is about loss. It certainly is not the only story of loss that could be told about the Aboriginal people of Australia, and it has been told by many others about genocide, displacement through theft of land, decimation through introduced disease, and the taking of native children for improvement and on and on in the usual tragic litany that leaves behind a broken culture prone to violence, alcoholism, and suicide. Their loss is a legacy of our intemperate penetration of an age-old culture, which in the coy observation of its premier chronicler, Theodore Strella, was one of no mean order. The tale of my journey to Australia weaves both Aboriginal and white fella stories, historical and contemporary, garnered from literature, first-hand accounts, and my own observations, all given their place, touched upon lightly and with only the slightest discernment, all attitudes given equal stature. It is a fictionalized memoir, so-called because I arranged events to streamline the narrative, changed some names, including my own, and reassigned some quotes to invented characters. Historical events and their actors are presented as accurately as possible. My story unfolds in Central Australia, also called The Centre, where the traditional Aboriginal life lived as hunter-gatherer nomads for tens of thousands of years, remained undisturbed by white encroachment for a century past English settlement along the coastline. 
In 1840, Australia's interior was unknown, hidden beyond coastal fog banks. A challenge was raised for the most enterprising spirit who would lift the veil off the desert to plant the flag of the mother country in the very center of the adopted one, there to leave as a sign to the savage that the footsteps of civilized man has penetrated so far. And for whom posterity would name a leaf in the laurel crown of English exploration. The naturalist Peter Egerton Warburton answered the call and later wrote in his diary from his recovery bed, whilst the agony was fresh in mind, of his expedition to the interior in 1875. He experienced Central Australia as the greatest absolute blank on the face of the globe, the polar regions accepted, barren, inhospitable, a dreary waste, a howling wilderness. Ernest Giles, a couple of decades later, early on the day he discovered Ayers Rock, noted in his diary that he was traversing untrodden wilderness, even as he offered a description of the area's inhabitants. I quote him for his marvelous sense of entitlement. I saw another lot, some 20 or 30, scudding away over the rocks and hills to our right. One gentleman most vehemently apostrophized us from the summit of a rocky hill and most probably ordered us away from his country. We paid, as may be supposed, but little interest to his yells, as his words to us were only wind we passed on. Several decades more pass before a sympathetic observer begins his career in the center, the preeminent ethnologist Theodore Strello. He writes that to the aboriginals, the whole countryside is his living, age-old family tree. He will always speak of his birthplace with love and reverence, the mountains and creeks and springs and water holes are not merely interesting or beautiful scenic features in which his eye may take a passing delight. They are the handiwork of his ancestors from which he has descended. Of the aboriginals, I knew little when I first set out. From my father's library, I had taken a book about early human types. The book's only photographic illustration was of an Australian aboriginal, shaggy-headed and black-skinned, seated with his children in the middle of nowhere, straightening out a spear held between his legs. The book cited the Australian Aborigine as an aspect of mankind's heritage, as exemplars of our universal Stone Age. That very prospect enthralled 19th century ethnologists who imagined Aboriginal Australians as remaining the absolute bedrock in the scale of civilization. This was not meant as a slur. There had been a finer motive for the ranking. Working forward from this uncontaminated race, a race abandoned by time on an isolated island, British ethnologists believed they might reveal the operations of the human mind in its upward progress from savagery to civilization. It was also believed that among the nomads of Central Australia, humankind's first impulse toward religion might be discovered. Observations were made and tentative theories proposed. This looks like the beginning of our baptismal rite by immersion, and so forth and so on. Is it not humbling? The abundance of fanciful notions and seductive gossamers produced to support a faulty premise. Credible insights were also made notably by an unlikely couple, the Alice Springs Telegraph Station manager, Francis Gillen, who arrived at his post wide-eyed for the natives, and the Oxford-trained naturalist, Baldwin Spencer, whose scientific expedition happened to disband at Frank's door, 1875. Theirs would be a consequential meeting. A lively correspondence between the two men ensued, an exchange of raw data from Gillen on aboriginal practices for Spencer's refined theory. A letter from Gillen might typically include, we are daily getting deeper into the mysteries of aboriginal life, or 
I am inclined to your idea, but will make further inquiry. Gillen's letters and rough field notes sent to the prof over four and a half years narrate their passion for penetrating aboriginal secrets. It was the greatest of treasure hunts, deluding competing investigators and eager to publish. Gillen and Spencer were the first to recognize Turunga stones as the key to understanding everything aboriginal. The mythological ancestral beings, the inalienability of the aboriginals from their land, and their devotion to the law that determined rights and governed ritual. Towards the end of their joint venture, Gillen would write to Spencer at his university in Melbourne, we are now seeing things which no white men have ever seen before or are likely to again for some time. This male's notes, if they do not entirely elucidate the Chirunga problem, go so near a perfect solution that I doubt we shall get deeper. With the publication of their several books credited simply to Spencer and Gillen and the Magic Lantern Lectures on Aboriginal Custom, academic interest in these objects was inflamed. Thereafter, restraint was not even possible. Researchers claimed Chirunga wherever they were found for science in the name of science. So began a plague of plundering. Gillen himself was an aggressive, ruthless, even, collector of these sacred objects. However, as his understanding of the critical importance of Churunga within the culture grew, so his conscience was awakened. He would eventually write to Spencer, there must be no more Churunga robberies. I bitterly regret ever having countenanced such a thing and can only say I did so when in ignorance of what they meant to the natives. Spencer concurs, writing that, the loss of Chiranga is the most serious evil which could befall a group. On the very few occasions that the sacred storehouses have been robbed, the aggressors were white men. On each occasion also, the natives killed the member of the tribe who had shown the spot to the white men. Two other serious-minded collectors, missionary Carl Strello, and his son, the aforementioned Theodore, the future ethnologist. Carl was posted to the Lutheran mission uh, at Hermansburg, where my father, much later, would purchase his Turunga. Carl had a sympathetic ear, so that even while divesting the natives of their sacred objects and shipping the Turunga off to the Volkers Museum in Frankfurt, he also worked late at night transcribing his notes on mythology and ritual made while talking with the old men. In his eventual book section, De Chorunga der Aranda, he writes, when the novice has grown to a man, his grandfather conducts him to the hidden storehouse where the Chorunga of his forefathers are kept and shows them to him with the words, this is your body, this is your second self. When the Chiranga are properly attended to, Carl wrote, a man's well-being is assured, guaranteed, in fact. Considering how quickly Aboriginal binding strictures dissolve the Lutherans, it looked to me had found the lever to successfully rout the opposition. Carl's son, Theodore, was born at the mission and raised among the native Aranda children, speaking their dialect. Educated at Adelaide University after his father's death, he would return to the center in the 1930s. And finding his native playmates, now men of importance, he made his career as an ethnologist, collecting and transcribing sacred songs, recording secret ceremonies, compiling genealogies, writing songs of Central Australia, the definitive book on the sacred life of the Aranda people, and in course, compiling an impressive collection of Chirunga. Strello knew that for the Aboriginal, each Chirunga was the immortal body of a totemic ancestor, transformed at the end of its primordial labors and left behind in the care of the people 
the seminal object that, when properly maintained, sustains all life. Theodore Strello witnessed the disintegration and he thought the collapse of aboriginal culture. Yet in the 60s, bands of natives were coming out of the desert to see him in Adelaide, looking for their father's churunga. They told him, the sacred ways have to be carried on. Yet believing himself to be the guardian of all that remained of genuine aboriginal culture, Strello stood his ground. He demanded, then sing me your sacred songs as they were given to you by your father or your grandfather. Of course, he knew the songs better than they did. In the end, he just told them to mind their own business. He died with his collection intact, the most celebrated and vilified ethnologist in Australian history. The South Australian Museum in Adelaide held, perhaps still holds, the world's largest collection of Aboriginal sacra. The museum also drew the attention of elders and their allied land councils from the center. They demanded, you've got our stuff and we want it back. In 1993, Canadian Christopher Anderson was hired by the museum to address the challenge of mediating the vexed problem of reconciling men, museums, and their sacred objects. First, Mr. Anderson had to convince the museum board that they were not the owners of these things, but only their custodian. He de-emphasized the curatorial sanctity of things and instead used the collection to build cross-cultural relationships. His contention was that the Chiringa were not given forever to museum expeditions, but were extended as an act of social engagement. Anderson, when he was able to bring these objects back to the bush, found that there was no great surprise that they had been returned. He believed that was the aboriginal way. His work was patient, meticulous, and ultimately rewarding for all concerned. With what little understanding I had of the dynamic underway in Australia, I was fascinated, electrified, and I wanted to record it all. I arrived in Australia in the midst of this turmoil, carrying one disconnected, secret, sacred Chirunga stone, a notebook, and a camera. Upon my arrival in Adelaide, I consulted with the South Australian Museum's historian, Philip Jones, who had contributed a paper to the Oceania monograph, Politics of the Secret, <clears throat> which is devoted to the transcultural issues of Chirunga ownership. A good read on a subject that is little written about nowadays. I also spent time in the museum exhibits and archives and visited the Strello family at home. I left Adelaide for the center to Alice Springs with a very happy prospect. My Chirunga's return was all set up. I was to hand over my Chirunga stone to Aboriginal elders on stage at the annual Australian Rock Art Conference. I had been invited by the conference chair who promised, the handing back of your stone will be a symbolic act of practical significance. And whatever he meant by that, I bought into it. Furthermore, he intended that my on-stage handover of the stone would be a celebration of reconciliation. I would envisage, he said, that you give a speech with the artifact concealed, and the senior custodians of the area will come forward, say some words of gratitude. It will be a kind of goodwill ceremony, one in which you bring the stone home. The director of the Strello Research Center in Alice Springs, co-sponsor of the conference, put the kibosh on that idea. The SRC, you see, was built to maintain control over the Chirunga collected by Theodore Strello, confiscated by the state from his home after the man's death. These objects are kept locked up in the CRC in accord with Strello's wishes as expressed in his lifetime. In his office afterward, the director, Brett Galt-Smith, offered me kind advice. 
Brett is a white Australian sitting, it is occasionally noted, on a time bomb. He explained to me that my intended return was not suited to amateurs. He said, there are very strict traditional laws governing the way Churunga are handled by Aboriginal men. Men from one country have no rights to the Churunga belonging to another. These objects are considered like title deeds to land because they're linked with specific sacred sites. Even if the Churunga's home territory were to be identified, a Churunga stone's depicted topography might not always quite match the current land tenure or the current state of alliance politics. It's very hard to recognize who has rights, even within the Aboriginal community, because of the fragmentation that's happened over the years. These disputes can lead to violence. These objects can still cause people to be killed. I put my hands, I'm sorry, I put myself in the hands of the Alice Springs Central Land Council whose statutory mission includes the appropriate return of sacred objects to their aboriginal constituency. I had already heard plenty of stories of unsuccessful attempts to return sacred objects, so my expectations were muted. Richard Kimber, the historian, had described to me a personal experience with a crate of undocumented Turinga. He said, I was present in a situation where a couple of hundred Aboriginal people were given the opportunity to look at stones. All the young men averted their eyes, didn't look on at all. The old men simply glanced, just turned away, and kept walking. You see, there was no indication of rights. In the end, four old men came back, sat down, and discussed them with me because they believed they recognized the engraved designs and nominated general areas this belonged to that country, uh, this belonged to that country. In the end, there was nothing to be done for the objects but turn them over to the Central Land Council, which now holds them in trust. My contact at the Land Council, David, a young anthropologist, undertook a series of preliminary meetings with elders of different communities. Then days later, drove me to the aboriginal settlement of Papunya, some distance outside of Alice Springs. Papunya translates as, this place is shared, which is appropriate because there's a lot of different tribes there now. It was built in the 60s over a sacred site, an old ceremonial center for the dreamtime ancestor, the honey ant. I found Papunya basically a refugee camp graded out of the desert to contain aboriginals who had overwhelmed the barrier line of missionary food depots in a time of mass dislocation. Papunya was a desperate initiative to protect these people from total loss. The resources for the internees had been Spartan, rations, and boar water, and these days, welfare, sit-down money. It would be amazing, I thought, if any traditions had survived. It was not long before we were in the company of Long Jack Philippus Jacomara, Lutheran lay pastor, head man at Papunya, and celebrated dot painting artist. Long Jack was one of those last living who had walked out of the desert into the 20th century. He led David and me along with a band of his fellow elders to a remote spot outside the settlement. We all settled down on the sand to look, first at a photograph of the object, then the object itself. Reading from my book, Sacred Errand. Reaching into my satchel, I pulled it out and handed it over to Long Jack. With both hands, he lifted the stone up and examined it. Long Jack nodded gently up and down. He lowered the stone, enclosing it in his hands, and the tips of his fingers glided over its surface. He gently traced the spiral, following the mythic ancestor's journey inward to its center. From that spiral's node, his fingers cut to the neighboring figure and then down again to find its center. 
he ground his index finger into the central spiral and then to another, tap, tapping them. He said, Papanya, Papanya, honey ant dreaming, this one here. Long Jack's fingers traced the ancestor's journey across the land until each site had been touched and vitalized and his memory of the Churanga's dreamtime story was drawn into the present. Referring to the honey ant, or possibly to the stone, Long Jack said almost to himself, him traveling a long way. Looking at me, he said, that's a long way to come. Thank you for bringing it. In central Australia, the humblest fragment of the earth a Churunga stone revealed itself as sacred, and all nature and the cosmos in its entirety likewise revealed itself to aboriginals as sacred. From my point of view, Long Jack's sacred stone was just a fragment of the dream time's ruin. For Long Jack, the spirit in the stone was not contingent. The spirit in the object and the land, I'm told, remains out in that desert, circulating in vast currents below the surface, a mystic essence abides. Brett Galt Smith writes in the afterword to Sacred Errand, the attitude that the book's fictional narrator, Mark, carried was actually John's, that you can just give back cultural objects. That was the prevailing perception but there's always more to deal with for both the party in possession and the recipient. John's epic adventure in Australia became a journey into his soul. He continues, Churunga carried the spirit of a creation or totemic ancestor that once traveled the land. Aboriginal people in Central Australia have that same spirit abiding in them. They are in that sense one and the same. The human body, just as the stone or wood from which a charunga is created, is more or less a vessel through which the spirit flows in a cycle of reincarnation. The charunga is as alive as a person is alive. Jeremy Prescott Juparula is one of my composite characters and Aboriginal man with a long history of activism in the center. Prescott is not impressed with my sanctimonious talk about the inviolability of Churunga, nor my fretting for the dream time. He was a realist. He described the process of young men's assimilation, not into the ranks of dream time aspirants, but into football. He said, for the young man, there's the field of engagement the challenge of a rival team, the potential to rise up by your prowess to be captain, the whole range of stages mocking the path to become a tribal elder. When given a choice between that and going into the bush for 30 days, cut in various places with a stone knife or an old razor, <clears throat> taught a bunch of mumbo jumbo, the preferred choice is pretty clear. Why does the story told in Sacred Errand, 17 years on, matter? Does it matter if a Churunga stone is thought to be the immortal body of a mythic ancient ancestor or a collectible on a primitive art market? A primary object for the resurrection of Aboriginal spirituality or to others, if, like the Kabbalah, a Churunga stone is the magic gateway into an entire sphere of existence. The answer to these questions is, it matters. It matters because the collapse of traditional Aboriginal culture is everyone's loss. Anthropologists took oral cosmology and set it into script. But those strings of written words can no more evoke the aboriginal lived experience than the icons engraved on a churunga can cause the stones to speak aloud. 
Aboriginal voices once asked, how come that missionary wants to break our law? Very important law. It's all tied together with the land and the Charunga. The law is all one piece. Can't take a part out. Otherwise, it will fall down. In Australia, the strife and the grief and the struggle to recover in homes and community and national politics. Thank you.